Hey everyone, welcome back to Vulcan Deckmasters. Uh, we've just done casting a really quick match between Orange and Hawkeye. We're going to move on to Strifecore versus Kang. Again, Strifecore, everybody knows him. Probably uh, the nicest guy in the Hearthstone scene, if anything. And as far as Kang goes, we have very little information besides uh, the fact that he's not doing too well at the moment in the Vulcan League. No, but he's not alone. I mean, at least yeah, there, right. You know, there's worse things in the world. It's like if you suffer alone, and you're like the only, like for example, after Swiss is over in seven rounds, there's usually only one guy that truly went right. zero seven. It's like, well, that that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, right. In this case, Kang is zero three. Um, if you go zero four, at least he's not alone. Hawkeye would be doing the same. Shrifegar, in the meantime, is two and one, and I think he's guaranteed a spot to at least contest for the playoffs. Uh, winning here would guarantee him to go through, though. Um, and I think, you know, it's important that Kang can redeem some pride, uh, which I know the Korean players are always very big on. They want to make sure that they have, they can maintain their sense of dignity as a pro gamer. And um, in this case, taking out Strive Code would be a really good boost to the pride. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, facing off against a player that you know is super consistent and then you just take him out. Even if the, the last thing you do in the event, you know, it's always a... A little bit of a thing. So we'll see if Kang actually brought uh, something that can counter Strifecrow. He brought Druid, Warrior, and Hunter. His Hunter is banned, and Strifecrow on the other end has Paladin, Hunter, Warlock with a Warlock band. All right, so apparently Kang feels more comfortable going up against Hunter Paladin with Druid, Warrior. I wonder how good that is. Uh, depends on what Warrior, right? If it's the Patron Warrior against Paladin, it's actually excellent. Uh, yep. Druid is in a really weird spot because I think Druid is all of a sudden good again. And there's these weird switches in the tournament metagame where classes just become good again. And people can't really explain why. And it's almost as simple as maybe people become comfortable with it again and they realize that the matchup isn't as bad mentally and then they just look at the percentages and it's good so for example um druid against patron warrior people always thought druid was really bad because it's no like, okay. if you if you think about it how do you clear a board of patrons on turn five as druid if they go for inner rage you know and the whirlwind effects with death spite it's like well you can't swipe and you know wrath remove everything you, like you just create more patrons but then they realize that if you just pressure the opposite end and just like, you know, do the same thing Druid always does, which is play yeah. minion threats and combo and be able to kill Patron, uh, you might actually be good. So now if you look at the math, I think Druids in tournaments actually have like an absurd win rate against Patrons, like 60 plus percent. Um, and people feel good about that matchup again, even though everyone for a while was like, no, I'll never try to cue Druid into Patron. Well, so it's really interesting, I think. It's kind of weird to look at that because if you think, like, as you said, if you think about it, there's like, sure, you can't clear the Patron board, but this is... Like, for them to get a patron board, let's say on turn 5, they have to have the inner rage with the patron and the death spite. Like, this is the worst case scenario. Um, right. And when that happens, I mean, sure, you know, the, the game is yours, take it. Uh, it's that, you know, that 40% you're never going to win. But very often, you've got tempo by that point. You know, your shade's big enough. You've already got, you know, a pilot of shredder, a 5 drop, might have come out even turn 3, uh, being yep. a druid. So the pressure's on your side. Like, you've got the proactive play. Dr the warrior is just trying to combo at that point, unless they really drew like God, so. Yeah, it's true. I think, um, you know, druids are like, well, I still have wild growth. And then even if they do get it out in turn 5, I could be hitting, like, really powerful turn 7s. Uh, not to mention, I could always get ahead of the curve with innervates. Um, or, you know, better yet, I could be doing a lot of damage early on and he's whacking things with taunt that just takes him repetitive damage. Yep. And then I use just one Savage Roar and end the game. But um, I, I, don't, I don't know if that'll be the case here. I, the point being is that I know that Druid might be a class that people always scratch their head at. It's like, shouldn't it be kind of weak considering mid-range Hunter is popular? You know, you see a bunch of Zoo that's out in there, even people playing Temple Mage now, and, you know, Paladin still really effective against Druid. It's like, shouldn't Druid be bad? It's like, no, it's actually, it's actually okay. It's really weird to describe it, other than the fact that it's, it's, it's okay right now. Yeah, it's I'd like to look at them, because I remember there was a thread about that on Reddit, about the, the cycles, like the time it takes for a metagame cycle to happen, you know, from one for one deck to be popular, and then another, like, let's say, mid-range hunter is popular, then face hunter comes to counter it, and then another deck takes over as far as the metagame popularity. Like, how long do those cycles take? Because in Magic the Gathering, the metagame cycles really fast. Like, it's about... You'll have, like, three decks interchanging their top spot. But in a game like Hearthstone... There's like 16 decks 
just constantly fighting. So the cycles that the time it takes uh, for this, the metagame to reset to the point where you know mid range hunter is now tier one and the best deck, it takes a while. Like you'll go from mid range hunter and then you'll end up at the opposite, like po uh, polar opposite, mm -hmm. where I don't know, you know, freeze mage is dominating and then. Suddenly things change again and mid-range hunter comes back. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of it's kind of an interesting dynamic, and I really wonder how long it takes. Well, I uh, I think it could be as simple as people figuring out um, a good tech choice that's good against what's popular, or it right. could be the influx of new content. And if you think about it, Noxious, this tournament series is I mean, hypothetically, if it releases content by the um, end of the month, I mean, you never know if and the this, the actual finals of the Vulcan deck matches, we have a chaos of new decks coming out here. So I'm 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 hoping to see uh, what we can have. I think yesterday we had a few leaks about what no, the players they were actually have, fan made. But right? yes, but apparently they're fan made. However, okay, must I remind you? And actually, I was watching your video. I was watching your video where you were revealing four new legendary cards, and that actually was so hilarious because the top comment in that video was like, Noxious, you must be trolling or drunk or both because I can't seriously believe that one person is stupid enough to believe that these cards would actually be made. And it was right. about Iron Juggernaut <laughs> released like the 10 day card draw, and they're like, yeah. there's no way Blizzard would actually make it. It doesn't even fit the lore. It doesn't like function correctly. It's too powerful. It doesn't even make sense. And it actually ended up being correct. So as much yeah. as... Um, you know, as much as maybe it's probably not the actual cards, you never know. I think it'd be really funny if that actually been the case. Yeah, so it's kind of um, it's kind of a crazy thing. Like the cards that we get leaked sometimes on a Hearthstone. Like I can't even tell you really where that thing, those things come from. So I mean, hopefully we get to play around with the uh, whenever you play a a dude as a paladin, he gets minion, gets divine shield. That'd be pretty cool, if not super frustrating at least. Um, I mean, a little yeah. guy that just keeps I, getting Divine Shield over and over, that seems like a nightmare from, like, yeah. the worst possible depths of Paladin nightmares. Mm. I don't know, I feel like Divine Shield, is, a, is a, it's a mechanic that never really used to have a good representative. Like, we used to play Sunwalker a lot. Like, initially in Hearthstone, you had, like, Sunwalker, Argent Commander. Those yeah. were, like, the Divine Shields. Then people played Argent Squire and Zudex and Scarred Crusader, but... There's never really been of recent. Well, memory. you pretty much you pretty much named all of them outside of Tyrion. It's like, well, those are all like in the core set. That's all the divine shields we had. Yeah, <laughs> and then we started coming out with a few more interesting ones, like Noyotron, for example. Right. Um, yeah. It's 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 tough. Um, I, I don't really know. I don't really know if divine shield could truly be too overpowering of a mechanic because it's just like you, you already see well, you the blood knight, right? It's yeah, so easy uh, if if it ever becomes like overwhelmingly played, it's just easy. You just tech into blood knight, that's it. You got it. Um, okay. It's kind of dealt with. Fair enough. Fair enough. Oh well, what if there's a murloc in that warrior deck? Murloc warrior would certainly be a deck that surprises me, um, and it surprised me even further. If it won a game, because I don't think that's possible. Cold I think Oracle? I've seen and... Murlocs in almost everything, but not Warrior. I mean, I like Cold Light Oracle as a card engine. I, I tried out in Warrior. I'd be willing to give it a shot in Patron. Let the pain mm. speak to me. You know, you yeah. cut those uh, Gnomish Inventors, and then you just curve yeah. in uh, Cold Light Oracle. It, it, it took me a second to process what you were thinking, but I, I think I got it. The general gist of how bad it was. But, uh, you know, it sounds like a really fun shit. At least, uh, on your <laughs> Sure. That's what it is, right? At least, uh, yeah, it's an experiment. The, exactly. The, uh, entertainment there. Oh, okay, wow. So Double the... fish and pick up here for, uh, for Kang with the inner rage. I mean, he already has one patron. So the second one feels a little luxurious. Like, more if you don't have. Like, say the first patron just played for tempo because you feel like it. Because the thing about the matchup against mid-range hunter is the same as the druid. Once upon a time, people used to think mid-range hunter was very easy. Considering it's like, well, I have executes and 2-2 two, two hyenas are good for me because I can use the, the patron against them. Um, but I think it's starting to convert based off the fact that mid-range hunter has a lot of threats that are hard to deal with. Uh, they're very good at stabilizing the board. Um, and they've just gotten better at playing the matchup overall. 
Yeah, I think the the fact that people got comfortable with it really changed a lot of things because now people actually know what to mulligan for. And I think mulligan is the most important phase of the game. Like a lot of people think, hey, can I, how can I get better? Well, I think the step one is mulligan properly. And then suddenly your win rate just skyrockets. Very often it comes down to that. So when a mid-range hunter knows what to pick up, then their matchups are looking a lot stronger. You know that double high main in Kang's hand is going to be a, a pretty big pain for... Uh, yeah, you know, I'm actually curious to see um, how Strife Crow chooses to play this turn. Because you can play the removal game, like you can kill Command and play Mad Scientist. Or you can even coin Animal Companion to see what comes out. Definitely don't want to leave the patrons out and force. Like, I don't think you should kill Armor Smith and like Coin or something like that. Uh, it's too risky. So I think you have to prioritize killing these patrons because if they that, that's the way they can win this matchup. If they control the board and that they can't really answer anything. Yeah, I kind of like Animal Companion because you know Huffer would let you kill the one four that's left over. Yes. Misha would also protect you. Oh, that's the worst. <laughs> well, poor uh, poor Strive Pro not getting exactly what he's looking for. Although no. that's not too bad. That's really awkward. Um, well, I mean, he can't charge with his patrons yet. So, <laughs> oh man. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually really funny. What um, the hell am I looking at? This light well can finally attack, and I don't think I, I know what a light well sounds like when it attacks. I'm I'm just imagining it's just like a sound it's of a, a really beam. powerful light beam. Yeah, oh, it's it? uh it's like it sounds like a wisp almost. Gotcha. It's like a, a shadow step or something, right? Like type of thing. No, wisp is like I don't know. Oh, oh wisp like, is I, like when you when you vanish and everything returns to hand, right? I don't know. It's like a, a it's a weird sound of magic. It's like jingles. Mm. There's a jingle jingle sound that goes with it. Gotcha. War song. Okay, he's gonna go so, for a war song with execute play. Yeah, I think he's setting up for patron next turn. Yeah, um, I like that. Yeah, he realizes I'm not going to be able to play the combo next turn anyways. Le Leoc's too much of a threat in case anything else comes out. Yeah. If he's now, got on leash, enough, no problem. Oh, yeah, but funny enough, um, now that he's you know played light well, it doesn't have an attack. It actually doesn't give you you know infinite armor slash patrons. It's just a 0-5 now. Versus keeping the Leoc alive. You know, alive. yeah, and just getting an infinite amount of little patient Yeah, <laughs> allows him to fill the board. Oh, well, I don't think he's going to need them anyway. Oh, man. He's good, he's good. What a crazy hand here. So, you whirlwind first? Or do you whirlwind after you crash your unstable ghoul in? I think, ultimately, it's all about the execute play. So, I mean, you right. just go whirlwind execute on the high main. Then you can spawn little... Patrons for free. I don't even think you have to lose the ghoul, do you? I don't think you have you don't to. Have to, but yeah. you get more patrons that way. You're also safe against unleash if you keep the ghoul up, right? Yeah. Well, safe. It's uh, maybe a bit of an overstatement. Yeah, this play was better. I think because you get to kill off a uh, hyena. If you crashed in first, you'd waste the damage on the high main itself. Okay, so and now you get to kill off the hyenas. This is a very nice sequencing from killing. And Strife Crow is not in the best of positions, but the good news is that Warrior is out of cards. Um, you know the bad Battle news Rage. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like Battle Rage kind of solves the problem. I mean the rest doesn't, but at this point Strife Crow basically has no out. Like I can't think well, of a thing that really stops the board. Maybe like a misdirection. For two patrons to kill one another. He's kind of like dead no matter what. Because he plays Freezing Trap. He just replays Grim Patron with charge and just attacks. I don't think there's a way for him to get out of this scenario. So it looks like yeah. that's it. Kang takes the first game over Strife Crow. Alright, so Patron Warrior is going to take it. So there's a chance that Kang is actually able to beat Strife Crow. Uh, maybe, as you said, you know, maintain some of his dignity at, at going 1-3 instead of 0-4. Uh, so if we get, you know, Kang is going to be playing his Druid here, he's got no choice. Against Midrange Hunter, not exactly the best. And against Paladin either, so it's going to be a pretty tough matchup for him. Like, the, the sequence of deck that he that he ha might have to go up against are not exactly favored for him. See, that's that's what, you're absolutely correct on paper. Like, Druid versus on paper, Midrange okay, Hunter, so you would expect, it should be tough. All right. But Druid versus Paladin, it also is tough. 
And yet, Druid still finds a way. It's like, it just blows my mind. Now, yesterday it wasn't the case. Yesterday, Brian Kibler was up 1 0. He had two Druid matchups that he's not favored against, and he ends up getting reverse swept. But that's not always the case. Like, if it was that predictable every single time, Hearthstone would actually be very boring because, um, you know, if everything, if every matchup is 100 0, then there's no point of actually playing it out. Yeah. So there is a chance that Druid can take it out under. I would say Hunter generally has the nods. But uh, I wouldn't underestimate it. The Koreans, generally speaking, the entire Asia region in general, really like swingy cards. They love the Black Knights and the Kazans and the, uh, you know, other cards that I can't think of. The MC Tech. Big Game Hunters. Yeah, the, the MC, MC Techs, Tech, exactly. Yeah. They, they, I they think MC Tech things. is the biggest one, yeah. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if this Druid has, like, Ooze and Harrison. It's like, that, that seems to be one of those things where they could have... That type of dynamic. Didn't I've been life seeing coach some bring things. that. I, I know life coach brought that against um, surrender. He brought Ooze and Harrison in both of his decks, and although it was super heavily teched against what surrender brought, it still wasn't enough to get him in. So, yeah, yeah. All I right, so. I I've got a question for you. I was talking about this with Lothar earlier. You know how Druid is a very static deck. Like it's been like sure, there's ramp. I mean, sure, there's, you know, the uh, the old-school hybrid token druid that just never really took off. There's been dragon druid around the metagame, attempts right. at Mo Malagos and stuff. But, like, competitively, there's really just mid-range. And mm. it's been like that for quite a while now. Do you think it's being held up design-wise by uh, Innervate and Savage Roar? Um... I mean, uh, it's hard to say. I think uh, Druid has to play those cards. Um, they become a really poor class overall if you don't because they have really bad options. Right. I think, I, I don't think Lothar's... I think, you know, he, he hates those cards for good reasons. There's Harrison, by the way. Um, but Casually. I, I, I also think that it's because there's a lack of options for Druid to legitimately build in another way. Yeah, that, that's kind of what I'm saying. Like, right. if you keep Innervate in Savage War, um, aren't you forced to give Druid's crappy cards to compensate? Like, Recycle and, you know, mm. Volcanic Lumber. Because if you suddenly give them a class-exclusive Shredder, then you might just push them over the edge. Is Let, let's, let's go ahead and look at Warrior, for example. Um, people really thought that Control Warrior and really, really cheesy Aggro Warrior were probably the only two things you could ever do. Um, because of the way Warrior was designed around armor. And all of a sudden, you see Patron Warrior legitimately being able to not only create a new archetype, but bring out cards that were underutilized. Um, you know, Druid does have ramp and very defensive style, but it's not as effective. And maybe it's just missing a few cards. Like, maybe they, people thought Tree of Life could have been something like that, but it's really not. Um, or Volcanic Lumber, maybe, but it's really not. So they're still, I think they're missing a few pieces, but that's what makes it exciting, because Blizzard doesn't always only look to how to make relevant cards out of the yeah. new ones, but also bring out some of the old ones and bring synergy there. Well, hopefully we get a functional, you know, hyper-competitive mill deck, you know, Ties of Time style. You just uh, bring that Volcanic Lumber with Poison Seeds and... Uh... Be, be careful what you yeah. wish for, man. <laughs> you talk about, un like, lack of interaction. There's no yeah. way you can stop cards like Naturalize and Cold Light from drawing out your deck. The only way you can counterplay that is Gang Up with Rogue, which is also a milled deck in itself. <laughs> All right. So Anyways. that's kind of amusing. Back to the game, for real. Actually, onto the game. We really haven't talked about it too much. Basically, um, Kang picked up Wild Growth oh, and Innervate, and he's got his Harrison Jones. So, you know, he slipped in a word, a casual word about that fact. But if the bow comes out from Strife Crow, Kang can just handle it right away. Yeah, it's not supposed to be like that weapon removal is the only way to beat Hunter. In fact, his Harrison Joe's not going to do anything. Yeah. But it's the idea that Kang could be better equipped to deal with that than a normal druid, so to speak. However, with the popularity of the Patron Warrior, the fact that Hunter is still relevant, and even the aggressive Paladin making a stop into the metagame, I think... Harrison Jones is almost auto included to Druid, in my opinion, because it helps shore up those matchups so well. Yeah, and you honestly like BGH, don't, right? yeah, you honestly don't lose too much tempo by playing it on five mana for five four. It's like there's really, I mean, it challenges so many things nowadays, like Sludge Belchers and um, a lot of the five fives that come out, like Thorson. Yeah, Soundmaster here is beautiful for uh, for Kang. 
I mean, for Strike Lord, that is just killing the Druid of the Claw that Kang put down. I thought it was going to charge it up into Misha and trigger the uh, possible freezing, but ultimately, I think all he wanted was uh, to avoid triggering a possible snake trap. Yeah. He's playing around Snake. It's kind of my question at this point. He looks like he is, but I couldn't tell. Either way, should, shouldn't he attack into it? It's tough to say. He, he should do it. The thing is, if it's Snake Trap and you attack, I don't think you're getting punished that much. Like, it's not that bad, but you don't have your swipe, so maybe you're super scared yeah. and the thing is going you're just awfully wrong. I also like the idea of Maybe keeping that trap for where he plays a bow. You give it an extra charge, then you cycle Harrison for more. Yeah. So that might be his reasoning. He's about to get punished pretty hard, though, because now it's like two things. He can either set up a high main that's relatively safe and uncontested, or he can go for Unleash the Hound's Kill Command, keep the board, let his opponent react to it. Um, or even just set up the board and kill command and not even have to unleash because it's only two hounds, like that kind of stuff. Like you can just build the board and kill command here. And like now you're in the same exact position, but you have cheaper minions. Um, it's almost like a whoop de do so what? And Strike yeah. can push out such powerful tempo because he has Dr. Oh, Boot wow. as well. Well, Ken picked up something useful. I just, I, I think this play that he made, you know, just passing and playing Emperor could have backfired a lot more than it actually did. Like this, this force of nature is actually going to be a, a bit of a, a lifesaver here for him. He can also innervate Power to Shredder on the back of that if he wants to. Well, he I'd was really hoping. Not do. He was really hoping that was um, freezing trap though. Oh. <laughs> All right. The pickup for Kang. So you cycle that 4-3 into a 4-4, you're kind of like giving it a Young Priest's buff. Yeah, you um, you just basically summoned a better minion out of it. That's that's the that's the best case scenario. <laughs> Wait, could he actually force Millhouse to be returned? Mm, oh, you could. That I could think. be really funny. Yeah, with Unleash, it depends on what comes out of that Shredder, if anything ever does. So, if you're Kang, do you want to return your Shredder or Millhouse? Because the Shredder's going to cost six, but Millhouse is only four, right? Hunter doesn't have the most amount of spells compared to some other classes, but there mm -hmm. are a good amount that you're afraid of, like kill commands, quick shots, animal companions. Um, this is the worst turn to find wild growth, I think. Like, yeah. Is the, like this and the second Innervate were the worst two cards to draw because they don't functionally do anything this turn mm -hmm. so he he's gonna attack with the shredder replay like it and then hero power down yeah and it's very like unfortunately for him his harrison jones has just been a nothing all game long yeah i mean it's just you know he should have played drew the claw in the spot that he did and it's correct it's just that there's no weapon to benefit off, benefit off mm -hmm. of so it's one of those scenarios where sure you have the tech cards but is it appropriate? And this is a really good case study of why you shouldn't always be relying on tech cards to carry you in the matchup. Sure, you might have a Kazan Mystic for like a Hunter, but Hunters can win without traps very easily. Yeah, you know, and if you spend four game. mana on it, it might not even help you that much. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, Stratcrow picking up the second Creeper. Sick. Because why not? Well, it's not like it's going to be a big deal. Right, I don't think it's gonna be that big of a deal for uh, for him. But imagine if Doctor Boom summoned two more haunted creepers, that'd be pretty sick. Yeah, I was doing a uh, an analysis of Anixia versus Doctor Boom yesterday, and I actually realized like there is absolutely zero reason to ever pay two more mana for this. Like, I haven't been able to come up with a reason why I would ever do that. Well, if you played in Druid, you'd savage roar, so you have more mana. Um, or if you're playing Shaman, you can bust. That's about it. Yeah. If you can benefit off the 1-1 one, one tokens being able to be buffed, um, you know, Shaman also has things like... You know what? Like I said it wasn't going to be a big deal, but I lied. That Zekin Creeper is actually going to be quite nice. Yeah, like, look at this. He's got insane amount of juggles and explosive potential this turn. Uh, bomb goes into the 4-1. Nope, Dagger goes into the 4-1. So, double He really trade. wants to kill that shade. So you have to double double trade the creeper, right? 
Right. Um, you don't have to. You can keep one to hedge your bet against swipe. You can, in fact, crashing into this and it kills it off the the ship's cannon. He doesn't get a choice. If it just kills off the ship's cannon. Dude. Oh man, this is the worst. That's why I thought he was gonna do it first and surrender one of the spiders to get another chance at okay. uh, getting shades. All right, we'll get. We'll see where that leads him. Either way, he's still very, very far ahead from Kang, who needs to pick up a swipe or pretty much die. He's got one card draw. Card draw to rule them all. Blinktron Harrison Jones, here it comes. Blinktron uh, Harrison, what does that even do? He can't even have enough mana to do that, but I know. he draws like a lot of cards. <laughs> even if you do Dream Hammer, it's like, you know, I've done zero that mana, bro. I've done that before. The Doom Hammer into. Uh, I mean, how, how playable do you think that is? Like, I know the Ooze Harrison, the, the Ooze Blinktron is, you know, it's been played around with by like, quite a few people, but. Harrison Jones, not so much. Oh, wow. Well, that's game. Well played. Yeah, the hunter is just too much pressure for well the druid. Played. So things went according to the book. Um, nothing out of the ordinary here. Despite the but tech card, Harrison Jones, which didn't come in at all this game. Th this is what we come to expect from druid. Um, and against paladin, it's almost the same thing, too, because early tempo is too well established by paladin. If they get shielded mini bot into a muster for battle, that doesn't get answered. And then you play like Shredder or something else, and all of a sudden they get the best trades in the world, you know, if they have True Server Champion too. Right. And uh, Druid loses too much on the board because anything they put out from that point on gets Peacekeeper to quality. That's what should happen on paper. Now, of course, if Shaco's playing Aggro Paladin, then. It's even worse, isn't it? Well, uh, I guess it depends I, I on the. It really depends on how much ramp the Druid picks up. It's just that, like, no matter what deck you're playing. As a druid, uh, no matter what matchup you're going into, it seems like you're always looking for almost the same. You know, I thought he was realizing that the shade play last turn was really weird. I don't know if I like Force of Nature. I think you're okay at least if you play Ancient of Lore, you draw cards. Yeah. What if Force you pick up Innervate and Wrath? Right, like you pick up both. That could be the dream. Uh, Belcher and uh, Azure Drake. All right, not the worst draws, not the worst draws that can be weaved in with a hero power if that comes to be relevant, but at the moment, yeah. not so much. Th those are two, I mean, don't underestimate that Harrison on the muster for battle gives mm -hmm. some yeah. card draw too. So Ken can also play you know, a little, a little dis disadvantage in terms of the card count and it won't be the end of the world. Yeah. The Strife Crow know that there's a Harrison Jones in that deck, because if he doesn't have the information that he might not be playing around it optimally, and as a result, um, it might not be that bad. So Kang seems to be still hanging in there. He's got decent card quality in hand, and as you He's said, he has muster against... Mm. Oh, snap. Mm. Oh, snap. That's right, Oxus. Big jokes. Big jokes for big folks. We got Dr. Boom coming out for turn 7, by the way, for Strife Crone. There is no big game hunter. So hmm. what's going to be difficult is that Kang doesn't have the proper response. So even if Harrison Jones lands on a quartermaster muster for battle next turn, or the, on turn 8, excuse me. Well, yeah, that's, that's, that's all fine and use. dandy, but you don't have any semblance of board control considering you have three three threes, a Dr. Boom that's uncontested, and most likely a, a couple of minions that stick around, like Boombots or the Slime after the Sludge Belcher. Yeah, so he needs to basically swipe and BGH over the next two turns. Otherwise, this is going to get out of hand. And he picks oh! up the Big Game Hunter. <laughs> what a crazy pickup right here. Well, I'm actually uh, I'm excited for him. He needs a swipe now, though. He needs that swipe. Oh, he'll get it next turn. Well, then again, those 1-1s one are going to become 3-3s. Three so how much of a swipe does he really need? Oh wow, those one ones are gonna become five fives. <laughs> is what they're gonna become. Unless Yeah. Strive I think Pro that's that's almost certainly the play. You have Muster for Battle and Quartermaster this turn, and then you have Quartermaster number two and True Silver the, on turn nine. Yeah, it's too good to pass, right? It feels like that. Well, Boombot's not actually doing it. I wonder if he's revising the plan to go True Silver now to get I kind an of easy like, clear. Yeah. That's, that's what I was thinking. Maybe he's opting for True Silver this turn, but that's really... Like, the, the curve of it doesn't really feel good. Um, Strife Crow also going back up to 23, recognizing that he doesn't want to give any chance for the combo to kill him. I like that. Very, very good idea. 
And Kang with a shredder play. Double shredder is actually really strong here. Actually, like the fact that you can weave in your hero power is what makes it super good. Oh, interesting. Were you expecting See, what, Dr. Balance? Or? I was expecting Dr. Boom to come out here or Ancient of Lore or something. Um, the two shredders are always easier to fill out your mana curve, but Dr. Boom gets increasingly more difficult. You're like banking on the fact that Paladin won't have an ant, like either has the best answer to it, which is Peacekeeper right, or Big Game Hunter, and you're right. trying to play around it. Or you're banking on the fact that Paladin has nothing in hand, like he's just sitting and waiting for something to happen, like with, with awkward cards, like a consecration. And it's like, and you're just hoping that this complicates it. See, even the game highlights <laughs> Dr. Boom. That's what you should have played last. I was, was going to say, man, that Dr. Boom yeah. is telling you something right there. He's actually entering Kang's unconscious and yeah. laughing at him, like the same play way he gets me. played onto the board. Play me. You didn't play me? <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna lose this game. Your top decks are gonna be terrible. Oh, man. Well, in this case, how do you deal with Tyrion now? Force of Nature seems like the easy play. Well, the easy play. I mean, you could also just Wild Growth pick up, you know, what's the name? Keeper of the Grove. And actually, what if you go for. No, I was gonna say, you can't really go for Emperor Thorson. Hmm. Well, what's really scary is that next turn there's 10 damage onto the board, and I don't think you can afford to take that much. Um, we don't really expect the burst from Paladin, but well, they it's the really idea good. that, yeah, if they're looming within th you know, distance that they can threaten you, you're in trouble. So also, Emperor, killing <laughs> Dr. Boom is actually a good idea here. Like, if you're not dead, that Force of Nature Savage War could be what carries you. And Treko needs to have, like, equality consec. Or just a simple, simple equality would probably help a lot. Okay, so he can't kill his opponent this turn. He only has 12 damage maximum. Will he die if he ignores everything? And it would be yes, because uh, yeah. Force Nature Savage will allow him to push through everything. So he has to trade. He can use that weapon... Uh, if it dies his next turn to also shove some stuff. And Echoing Ooze is a bad draw, but at the same time, all he needs is really the body that comes out of this to make Force of the Nature Savage more effective. And I think that's gonna be that's gonna be enough for him, because two of those minions into Tyrion should nail it. Yeah, but he doesn't have enough to push through it. Well, two of those like, like he doesn't have that to kill him. Yes. No, now, here's really what could happen, it. Noxious. Go. Are you ready for some magic? Double Boombot? <laughs> the Boombots hit the face for eight. Oh, no. well, that's it. No, Better actually, yet. yeah, he's got, he's got guaranteed lethal. Never mind. Yeah, he's got it. Yeah. That's um, it. He suicides both Boombots into Tyrion. They do two damage each, and he has conveniently 17 damage exactly to kill his opponent. Wait, is he playing Savage Roar without Force of Nature? Okay, so what's his follow-up plan? Like a Lotheb? I mean, how does uh, he... He's, so he's going to have to Wrath Sylvanas or something. And that yeah, seems... Yeah, this is really... to play around Sylvanas. He wants this to kill Sylvanas first. Yeah, but how do you deal with... That, that weapon? Like, I'm not sure about that. That seems... Unless he's got another roar just waiting to be played, <laughs> which he probably does. Lotheb that was is such a really play. sick. Oh yeah. my goodness. Uh, Kang, Kang's uh, got really good RNG off that. That's really <laughs> Let, let's leave it at that. Yeah, the RNG is kind of smiling on Kang this game. Most definitely. Well, Shrekko did draw Tyrion. Like, that was really nice, too. Um, you know, he didn't necessarily have to draw Tyrion to be able to push for this. But now Shrekko is also back into a board dominant position. Drawing with that Ancient of Lore also was, um, I think, the right play. It's just. A little bit, def you know, weak considering that you know that his opponent has the Ashbringer there, and you can't threaten to kill the following turn. Yeah, that's kind of what worried me about the play is if you play, if you kill Tyrion without trying to push for the lethal off the of Force of Nature, I feel like most of the time you're just gonna die to the weapon. Hmm, I but we'll see how Kang decides to handle this. It's, it's not over completely, mm -hmm. is it? Everything is too slow. Mm hmm. Sylvanas is like your closest chance of getting something done. Like you could kill your own Sylvan Keeper, top deck a Taunter, maybe that could do it. Like, 
I don't know if I like Keeper Wrath and Shade of Nyx Ramus because uh, I prefer it Sylvanas feels Shade. Pretty honestly. weak. Yeah. Well, I think Sylvanas Shade is by far. Wow, he's just gonna set up the the face damage potential. Strife Crow has a massive tail that his opponent is sitting on the second combo, if anything. Okay, this is really smart from Kang to just make Strife go scared. He's drawn so many cards. So now Strife has to second guess if he's if he can push face. But what might happen is um Strife Crow kills the keeper with the shredder, and then like he can't play around combo either way. So what he can do is control the state of the board and make sure Sylvanas doesn't get like really insane value. So he can kill off Sylvanas. And then kill off whatever Savannah steals pretty easy with the weapon. Consequently, you try to push he can just go all face and just yeah. be like, "Screw it! If you have it, you have it." Like, I mean, I, I'd at least kill the keeper, right? Like, if because that way, force of nature alone doesn't kill you. Like, yeah. I kind of like this. Sure. It's, uh, it's setting up for lethal, and if Kang doesn't pick up exactly what he needs, like he needs to find three damage. How does he find that? On top of Force of Nature, so he needs to find 3 damage and 4 mana. So Swipe is kind of like the only- OH MY GOD! That's lethal, and that's the end of the series. Wow, Kane drawing- <laughs> Wait, 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 he swiped first! Oh, 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 oh my god, oh that could have been a disaster. Kang. Anoyo You're Tron, daredevil. man. <laughs> oh, what is man. Anoyo Tron? Do you, know, do you really know what it is? If you swipe I, an Anoyotron or Frostwolf Grunt or anything that would have been able to stop him from being able to do that, like, would have been disastrous. I, I, I mean, there's there's a lot of, there's like four taunts, I think, that can come out of this, right? Anoyotron, Unstable Ghoul, Frostwolf, um, and there's another one that I forget, but yeah, there's, I mean, there's... There's also a really small probability of this happening, but it would have been the best thing. But the Explosive Sheep came out, he shoots... Uh, or, or, or like something happened. Oh no, he doesn't have enough juggling. Yeah, the, the, the juggler is not on his side because otherwise that could have been uh, epic. Oh, you're right, you're right, you're right. Yeah. Never mind. Not as yeah. cool. Not as cool. Still, that could have really backfired. And this is the kind of play. I mean, it, it, it sucks because you kind of want him to get punished for it just so he never makes it again. Right. Um, but not not really for the you know the purpose of being masochistic about it. So we'll at least uh, maybe try to let him know. But that's it. I mean, he's going to be able to go you know one three at least, not losing uh, f you know four times in the event. And Strife Crow, I think, is going to have to fight for tiebreaker unless. And we'll give you updates on this as soon as we know. Unless he just moves on straight up to the playoffs. So. Yep. Pretty, uh, All pretty right. Match. Well, uh, I think we're pretty much done with our second match. We have Kibler versus Nyria coming up on stream, and this one is meaningful for Kibler because he needs to fight for his tournament life, I believe. Yeah, he's got to be uh, at least in the tiebreaker battle. So we'll be taking a short break, and when we come back, we'll be casting it. Before we go, a little shout out to Squarespace.com for sponsoring the event. Obviously, if you don't know what that is, it's a website where you can build your own website. They're super professional looking, very easy to use, uh, very intuitive, and they're also not very expensive. So check them out. And uh, yeah, we'll be right back after the break. Don't 